What's the difference between MCMC and variational inference? Why is MCMC called an approximate method? When should we use VI instead of MCMC? These are some of the captivating and practical questions we'll tackle in this episode. I had the chance to interview Charles Margosian, a research fellow in computational mathematics at the Flatiron Institute and a core developer of the STAN software. Charles was born and raised in Paris and then moved to the US to pursue a bachelor's degree in physics at Yale University. After graduating, he worked for two years in biotech and went on to do a PhD in statistics at Columbia University with someone named Andrew Gelman. You may have heard of him. Charles is also specialized in pharmacometrics and epidemiology, so we also talked about some practical applications of patient methods and algorithms in these fascinating fields. Oh, and Charles's life doesn't only revolve around computers. He practices ballroom dancing and pickup soccer and used to do improvised musical comedy. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 90, recorded August 22, 2023. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, in the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country. For any info about the podcast, learnbasedstats.com is la place to be. Show notes, becoming a corporate sponsor, supporting LBS on Patreon, unlocking base on merch, everything is in there. That's learnbasedstats.com. If with all that info, a Bayesian model is still resisting you, or if you find my voice especially smooth and want me to come and teach Bayesian stats in your company, then reach out at alex.endora at pymc-labs.io or book a call with me at learnbasedstats.com. Thanks a lot, folks, and best Bayesian wishes to you all. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen. Maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming how would i know unless i'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like i'm richard Feynman. hello my dear bayesians i get a lot of people reaching out for help on their modeling projects so i have started something new if you go to topmate.io slash alex underscore andora you can sign up for some one-on-one modeling coaching with me And each week, we'll meet on a live call and I provide you with a step-by-step plan and practical tips to move past these momentary roadblocks. For bigger models, I even have uh, 15-hour and 20-hour packages to make sure my coaching is tailored to your goals and learning style and also to give you a small discount, of course. So if you feel a bit stuck or lost on your Bayesian project, feel free to check out topmate.io slash alex underscore endora. And together, we'll make sure to ace your next PyMC model. And now, let's talk MCMC and variational inference with Charles Margosian. Charles Margosian, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Hi, Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot for taking the time. I'm, I'm super happy to have you here. It's been a while since I wanted to have you on the show and now I managed to find the slots. And uh, thank you also to uh, a few patrons who sent me messages to uh, tell me that they would really like to hear about you on the show. So uh, thanks a lot, folks, for uh, being so proactive and uh, giving me ideas for, for the show. So, Charles, let's let's dive in. And as usual, I, c- I can bring up a, a very quick anecdote, which is I think two, three weeks ago, your show came up, uh-huh. and I told my colleagues I would feel like I have made it in the Bayesian statistics world if I get an invitation <laughs> to speak on learning Bayesian statistics. So, so I'm thrilled to be here, and you know, thanks for the the, the mysterious patrons incited this meeting. Yes, I'm sure they will. 
recognize themselves. Yeah, let's start with your origin story, actually. That's also something I found super interesting. How, how did you come to the world of statistics and, and pharmacometrics and epidemiology, Charles? I became interested in, in statistics and data as an undergrad, actually. I was studying physics. I was already in the US, I was at Yale, and I was working with an astronomy lab on exoplanets, and we had a lot of data. Mm -hmm. and so that generally got me interested in, in, in data science, but I wasn't introduced to, to Bayesian methods. And I always was a bit uncomfortable with how we handling uncertainty, what might we do about it. And I was fortunate after I graduated to actually get a job at a, at a biotech company where so the company was Metrum Research Group. They were based in Connecticut. And the supervisor I got there, William Gillespie, is one of the pioneers of Bayesian methods in pharmacometrics. And so he introduced me to Bayesian statistics, and it made a lot of sense. And, and I realized, oh, this is what I have been looking for when I was doing astronomy. And I started, you know, piecing this together. And to be fair, I hadn't done a lot of statistics before. I don't have the experience of struggling with classical statistics for a decade before being rescued by Bayesian statistics. I encountered Bayesian very early on. But even then, the, the way we, we quantified uncertainty, the fact that everything reduced to essentially one equation was extremely compelling to me. And, and Bill Gillespie hired me at Metrum Research Group to work on STAN. So this was back in 2015. And at the time, STAN was fairly new, very exciting, very promising. And you had these specialized software in pharmacometrics, but they were not open source. They were not really supporting Bayesian statistics, or at least that was not their priority. And they didn't give you the flexibility that a lot of my colleagues were looking for. On the other hand, you had Stan, which was open source, which had great algorithms to do Bayesian modeling, but which lacked a lot of the features required to do pharmacometrics modeling. One example was support for differential equation solvers. And all these models are based on ODEs. And at the time, Stan had you know, limited support for ODEs and more generally implicit functions. And then there were some more specialized things like handling, you know, the event schedule of clinical trials. And the, the project ended up being, we're going to write some general features, we're going to contribute them to Stan, and then we're going to write a specialized extension called Torsten. And that's going to have, you know, more bespoke features targeted at a pharmacometrics audience. And so that, that was my, my exposure my exposure to Stan, I can tell you about my first pull request, which, which Bob Carpenter and, and Daniel Lee reviewed extensively. They were very patient with my C++. <laughs> and my plan, my loose plan had been, well, I'm going to work, you know, for one or two years. I'm going to learn programming and statistics because I had gained an appreciation for it in astronomy. And then I'm going to do a, a PhD in physics. But Andrew Gelman, who I had met in an official capacity, like through my work, encouraged me to apply to the statistics program at Columbia University, saying, you know, if you do statistics, you'll still be able to work on the natural sciences and the physics that you're interested in, but, you know, you'll have, maybe a, you'll be able to make a more unique contribution as a statistician. So I took his word for it. And yeah, and once I had the offer from Columbia, I mean, it was a difficult decision, but I decided okay, I'm going to do a PhD in statistics. And that was a big change of field, but I did pursue that. I was able to continue working on STAN and on STAN adjacent projects. And just a year ago, I completed the, the, the PhD. So I would say that's the origin story that eventually led me to the Flatiron Institute. So that's where I'm currently. It's in New York. We're a nonprofit. We focus on applying computational methods to the basic sciences so big emphasis on collaboration. We have people who do astronomy, who do quantum physics, who do biology. And so that really resonates with why I wanted to do statistics in the first place, which I want to solve problems in the sciences. I can really relate to that. That was also kind of kind of what happened to me too. 
even though the first the first field was political science and not not astronomy but but yeah like definitely in the end applying the methods became became more interested interesting than than the field in itself so continued on, on that path the attitude i had so i had offers to do a phd in, in physics a phd in statistics and a bunch of different fields and at the time my attitude was look wherever i go i'm gonna have to do analyze some data understand where that data comes from i'm gonna have to have the tools to do the analysis or do the statistics so the idea is I think our loyalty is, is not to a discipline or to a field, it's really to a problem. You know, whatever problem we work on, there's always a lot that we need to learn. We're, we're never experts in a new problem, in a new research problem. And so kind of like, not try not to take the, the field that I'm in, whether it's for the PhD or even right now I'm in computational mathematics, right? You know, whatever that means. But I care more about the problems I work on than the department I'm affiliated with. Yeah, completely. Completely relate to that for sure. Like the the fact of using the method to solve uh, an interesting problem, whether it is about astronomy, political science, biology, epidemiology, it's like. And in the end, I find find that even more interesting because you you get to work on a variety of topics that you wouldn't have otherwise, and also you learn so much. So that's that's really the cool thing. Yeah. So thanks a lot for these uh, these introduction and so right now you're well these days you're, you're working at the at the Flatiron Institute as you were saying and it seems to be a very diverse organization we had Bob Carpenter actually recently on the show so I'm gonna link to his episode in the in the show notes but you Charles what are the topics you are particularly interested in these days at the, the flat time. Yeah, I think that I have a little bit two poles right now. There are a bit on the methodology side of things. And one of them is variational inference, which is a which is a form of you know it's called an approximate Bayesian method is what it's called. And really what it's what I'm trying to understand is when should we use an approximate method like variational inference, because it's in, it's incredibly popular. It's used in a lot of fields of machine learning. It's used a lot of times in artificial intelli- in artificial intelligence, and yet you have so many smart, brilliant people who are completely distrustful of variational inference. And it's also not difficult to to construct an example where it really doesn't do the job, where it really fails in a spectacular way. And I think that ultimately it depends on the problem you apply it to. And what we need to, to do is understand, you know, when can we get away with the approximations that variational inference proposes to do? Why does it sometimes work really well? Or why do we sometimes really get punished for using variational inference? And I can give you a very simple example of that, which was, so this was a recent work with with Lawrence Sol, who is also at the Flatiron Institute, he, he kind of heads machine learning there. And there's a statement that, go, that goes around, which is to say, well, variation inference will give you good estimates of the expectation value for a target distribution. So that's great. We often care about expectation values, whether that's in statistical physics or in Bayesian statistics. But on the other hand, it will underestimate uncertainty. Okay, well, what does it mean to underestimate uncertainty? You know, how do we make sense of a statement like that, which has appeared time and time again over the last two decades? And really, we realized that there were two measures of uncertainties that seem to come up again and again. One is the marginal variances, and the other one is the entropy. And so people like the entropy because it's a multivariate notion of uncertainty, and it's a generalization of the marginal variance, right? So when people say variation on inference, underestimates uncertainty, they usually mean you're underestimating the marginal variances and you're underestimating the entropy. Okay. And so what we ended up doing is demonstrating this on the Gaussian case, right? You have a Gaussian target, you're approximating it with a uh, with a Gaussian with a diagonal covariance matrix. So that's called the factorized approximation or the mean field approximation. And indeed, you underestimate the marginal variance and you underestimate the entropy. Now, here's where it gets interesting. <laughs> 
which is as you start going to higher dimensions, and for some reason, I don't think people people have only looked at you know really the two dimensional case because that's the figure that fits on a page. But if you start going to higher dimensions and you take limits where the dimension goes to infinity, you can construct examples where you actually get very very accurate estimates of the entropy, but you are underestimating the marginal variances in every dimension in an arbitrarily bad manner. And so the two notions of uncertainty are not at all equivalent and not at all interchangeable. And what ends up happening is you look at fields where variational inference is applied. So for example, in statistical physics, where, where people want to estimate the entropy of an easing model, for example, and that's where this factor is, this mean field approximation comes from. Well, here it works just fine. You actually get good estimates of the entropy, right, in certain limits. In machine learning, where you're trying to maximize marginal likelihoods rather than be full Bayesian, actually, you know, uh, you get good estimates of those marginal likelihoods. Right? At least that's our working conjectures. But in Bayesian statistics, where we have interpretable quantities, and we, you know, those marginal variances mean something for those parameters that have a meaning. Well, here, variation inference might really not do it, or at least not vanilla implementations of it. And that's an example of, you know, how by studying an example, we can start on the understanding why is it that some people are so enthusiastic about variation inference and other people are so distrustful of it, right? It really depends on what is the measure of uncertainty that you care about, and that in turn is informed by the problem you want to solve. So I bring this up as a, an archetype of the work that we're trying to do. You know, we want to understand this method when and why. Yeah, that's really interesting. First big topic. Yeah. The other big topic is I still do a lot of MCMC. I care a lot about MCMC because, uh, as we'll see in pharmacometrics, I really think that is our best tool to solve many problems. And here I'm, I'm trying to understand some more fundamental questions, right? So, so people often say, well, you know, yeah, MCMC is great, but it's too computationally expensive. That's why we'll use approximate methods. And, and one thing I will, I will argue is actually it's computationally expensive, but we don't really have a very good sense of how much computation we should throw at MCMC. Because ultimately we have, we have, you know, we have three fundamental tuning parameters, right? One is the number of chains that we use. The other one is how long is the warm up or the burning phase. And then the third one is how long is the sampling phase? And, and actually, you know, it's not clear what is the optimal computation that you should throw at an MCMC problem, right? I think people rely on heuristics. More often, they rely on conventions. These are the defaults in STAN and PyMC and TensorFlow probability. But actually, you know, we need to think about have we used a, a warm-up phase that's too long or too short or a sampling phase that's too long or too short, right? Or how many chains is it useful to do? Especially now we have GPUs. Right? In theory, I could run MCMC with 10,000 chains. And people do that now. Some people do that. A select few do that now, right? But what are the implications of doing that, right? I'll tell you an implication. If I have 10,000 chains that I'm running on a GPU, then I think the sampling phase can be one iteration per chain. Right? We can discuss this and, you know, we can argue for or against it, right? But it changes a little bit our perspective of how much computation we throw at it. Another perspective I like is if you have a strict computational budget and then you say, well, I'm not going to use MCMC. It's too expensive. Let me run variational inference. I know it's biased. I know it's approximate, but at least it, it finishes running in within 10 minutes. I'm like, well, run 10 minutes of MCMC. It'll be biased. It'll be approximate and it will finish running in 10 minutes. And then ask yourself, well, how good is, is this estimator? So thinking a little bit more carefully about how much computation do we really need for MCMC and for the different problems that we might be trying to solve? That's really interesting. Thanks a lot for that very clear presentation. I really love it. So let's actually continue on that path because I wanted to, to ask you about that a bit later in the show anyways. So yeah, several things that bumped into my, into my mind. First thing is MCMC is also an approximation method. So 
why do we say, why do we, and I know we usually do that in, in the field, we define variational inference as an approximation, an approximation method, which kind of underlies, assume that MCMC is not, but it is. So can you maybe draw the distinction? What makes the difference between the two methods and why do we call them approximation for variational inference? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that people think, like a lot of statisticians, asymptotically. So you know that asymptotically, in what sense, when you run a single chain for an infinite number of iterations, MCMC is, you know, not only going to, you know, generate samples from its stationary distribution, which oftentimes is the posterior distribution, but also Monte Carlo estimators with, you know, an arbitrary precision. Right? Your Monte Carlo estimator will converge to the true expectation value or the true variance or whatever it is you're trying to estimate. Whereas with variational inference, well, here we have to be a little bit careful because, you know, what, what does it mean for the asymptotic of variation inference? So you might say, okay, I'm going to run the optimization for an infinite number of iterations. So let's assume that the optimizer does converge. And actually, until recently, this was not really shown. There's a recent preprint that I know Robert Gower and Justin Dumkey have been working on where they actually showed that, yes, you know, under certain conditions, stochastic optimization will converge for variation and inference. But then even if it doesn't converge, you say, well, let me think about the approximation that minimizes my objective function. So oftentimes the Kohlberg library divergence, right? That's what I get asymp asymptotically. Well, that will still not be in general my target distribution. Even asymptotically, I'm still approximate. Right. I think that's why people draw this distinction between MCMC and, and variational inference. It's really in the asymptotic sense that MCMC is an exact method, whereas VI remains approximate, even if you've thrown an infinite amount of computation at your problem. Now, in practice, we're not asymptotic. We work with finite computation. And so I think it's, it's very important to, to recognize that, yes, MCMC is also an approximate method. It's not unbiased. Because you don't initialize from the stationary distribution, you do not reach the stationary distribution. So when I hear statements like, well, first we wait for MCMC to converge to the stationary distribution. I think people have the right intuition, right? I don't think it's a misleading statement, but nonetheless, it's an incorrect statement. What we do is we wait for MCMC to get close enough to their stationary distribution. And the reason why we care about being close enough to the stationary distribution is because we want the bias to be small. And so when we think about, you know, convergence diagnostic, the way I think we, you know, we really should start thinking about, you know, a quantity like the R hat statistics, for example. And R hat is interesting. R hat has been around for three decades. And frankly, we, there's still debates about what does R hat measure. I mean, this is very existential, right? We have an estimator, but it's not clear what the estimate is. And my perspective, my most recent perspective, is that what really matters, the reason I care about convergence is because I want the bias of my Monte Carlo estimator to be sufficiently small. It's not going to be zero, but it has to be sufficiently small. And so can R hat tell me something about how small my bias is? And here's the paradox, which is that R hat, the way you compute it, it's a ratio of two standard deviations. So you know that when you measure variance, it doesn't tell you something about bias, right? And yet, you know, we say R hat tells you if your warm-up phase is long enough. Not everyone agrees that that's what it tells you, but, you know, that's my perspective. And, and I think it's a reasonable perspective, right? But the, the point of the warm-up phase, you know, at a, the primary point, not the only point, is for the bias to go down, right? So we're faced with this paradox, this very fundamental question. Can R hat actually give us any useful information? And there was a recent paper that argued that, well, since R hat is really just looking at the variance, it's a one-to-one -one map. So this was uh, some really nice work by, so I know Dukida Vats is one of the co-authors on the paper, and there's another co-author, right? They call it revisiting the gelman rubin statistic. And they argue, well, R hat is just a reframing of variance and of effective sample size. And to me, effective sample size only matters when you're looking at the sampling phase because it tells you, is your variance low enough? And so we had to think a little bit hard about this because it wasn't completely satisfactory because either it means that R hat is not a useful convergence diagnostic in some sense, 
or actually there's more going on. And what we realize is you look at the variance that's being measured by R hat. So really what R hat ends up measuring is you're running a bunch of chains. It could be four chains, it could be more. Each chain generates one Monte Carlo estimator, and then you average the per chain Monte Carlo estimator. So now you look at the variance of a single chain Monte Carlo estimator, that variance, you can actually decompose it into a non-stationary variance and a persistent variance. And what we realize, and you have to be careful, you have to do that analysis for non-stationary Markov chains. Otherwise, you completely miss the non-stationary variance. And the non-stationary variance is, you know, actually, it's a measure of how well you've forgotten your initial point. And you can show in some cases that it decays at the same rate as the squared bias. So you're not directly measuring the squared bias, but because MCMC is what it is, the non-stationary variance gives you a proxy clock for the bias. And so our argument is that, well, what's interesting about our hat is not that it measures, you know, the persistent variance, which you can then relate to the effective sample size, but that it measures the non-stationary variance, right? And this then led us to, you know, we're coming up with re revisions of our hat which more directly measure the non-stationary variance rather than the total variance, so that we actually get an estimator that unambiguously tells you something about the length of the warm-up phase. And then you ask the question of the length of the sampling phase in a second and separate step. So, sorry, it's a conceptual explanation. So that this is a paper uh, that we have a preprint out. It's called The Nested R Hat. And this is joint work with so Andrew Gelman, Aki Vitari, Matt Hoffman, so some of the usual suspects. We also have Pavel Zumsov and Lionel Rieu Durand. So we've all worked on this together. And a cool anecdote here is that what we were really interested in is those regimes where we're running hundreds of chains in parallel or thousands of chains in parallel, like GPU-friendly MCMC. And what this made us do is, instead of taking asymptotics in the limit where we have an infinitely long chains, which is how asymptotics for MCMC have worked for the past, you know, five or six decades, right? Because that's what people did. They ran long chains, right? And so even though asymptotics are property of, you know, infinity, we want to somehow get close to asymptotic regime, right? That's why we care about this asymptotic analysis. And here we thought, well, let's take asymptotics in another direction. Let's say we have a finite number of chains, but what happens when we have an infinite number of chains? And then suddenly you can do asymptotic analyses on non-stationary Markov chains, right? So the problem is if I take an asymptotic in the length of the chain, well, I've made my chain stationary, and then there are only so many properties that I can study. If I take asymptotics in the other direction, which is the number of chains, then suddenly I can start making statements about non-stationary Markov chains. I can elicit terms such as you know, non-stationary variance. And this was a cool example where the hardware you know, trying to work with, you know, GPUs running a lot of chains. Actually, I think is really changing our theoretical approach and our conceptual understanding of MCMC. And I think we're going to get a lot of breakthroughs from this kind of perspective. Yeah, super interesting. I put the two papers you mentioned in the, in the show notes. And so that makes me think, basically, what would you say right now, practically for... For people, when would variational inference usually be most helpful, especially in comparison to MCMC? Right. So I think there, there are two things to unpack here. One is when can variational inference still give you accurate answers? And two, when do you actually not need an accurate answer? Right. So, so in the first question, it really depends on the family of variation and inference that you're willing to use, the family of approximation. And also, it turns out, the objective function. So I mentioned earlier that when I have this mean field approximation, and I'll just remind what mean field means is I'm assuming that all my latent variables are independent. Now, we don't believe that that's true in practice, but that makes the computation much cheaper. And when you have millions of observations, millions of parameters, you need an algorithm where the cost scales linearly with the, the number of observations. Right? And if I don't have this mean field assumption, I get things that can scale quadratically or cubically. 
And so when I do this approximation, well, I'm going to get some things wrong, but maybe I'll get the things that I care about right, which could be, you know, the first moment, or it could be the entropy. If you change the objective function, so actually the KL divergence, you can kind of reverse it. You can show that you get arbitrarily poor estimates of the entropy, but good estimates of the marginal variances, right? So, so it turns out that the choice of objective function that you use to measure, you know, the disagreement between your approximation and your target matters. So there's a real question of, you know, what are the quantities you care about? Because we don't care about the whole distribution. We care about some summaries of the posterior distribution. And then that informs when, when you use them, right? So I think that's the first question. And, and I want to emphasize that there's a lot of great work by, you know, Tamara Broderick and her group, Justin Dumkey and, and, uh, and his colleagues about, you know, trying to get more accurate variation inference. And sometimes that works really well, which is a bit of a, you know, I, I can't really give you a more precise prescription than that because we have to go into the details of, you know, the different problems. But then the second point I made is sometimes you don't need a really accurate answer, right? So what are examples of that? So, uh, you know, so in machine learning, let's say you're just training a model and maybe you're more interested in a more, you know, either a more complicated model or using more data than improving the accuracy of the inference. And then you look some, at something like, you know, performing a, a task, classification, prediction, and so forth under a computational budget. It turns out that it's better to have a sophisticated model with very approximate inference than a less sophisticated model with more accurate inference. Now, it's hard to know, in, you know, the, my big problem with variation inference is it's hard to know which regime you're going to be in and to actually justify it. And even once you've run variation inference, you don't have that many diagnostics that can tell you, well, you know, you're doing okay, but you would do much better if you improve the inference, right? So I think that it's an open question. But then the other example where, you know, that I want to bring up where we don't always need accurate inference is when we're developing models, right? So this stays back into this idea of the Bayesian workflow that now has been championed, you know, so Andrew Gelman and colleagues wrote a lot about it. Michael Bettencourt wrote a lot about it. David Bly wrote about a lot about it. You know, arguably George Box, right, wrote a lot about it. And... And, you know, if you if you ever work on an applied project, you sit down, you come up with the first iteration of your model, and arguably there are a lot of problems with that model. And you don't need super accurate inference to diagnose the problems with this model. You do a quick fit, a quick approximation, and, and usually something obvious is going gonna, is gonna to pop up. Then you revise the model. Then you do, again, quick inference, okay? And, and you keep refining and refining. And only once you have a, actually a polished version of the model – do I think that it makes sense to, you know, get out the big gun and the very accurate inference? Right? And I think that, you know, if we talk about pharmacometrics and epidemiology, I'll, I'll give you some very precise examples of those situations. Yeah, thanks a lot for that tour. That that makes a lot of sense, actually, all of that. I realize my answers are very long, but your questions are very deep. So uh, <laughs> that's really good. I mean, that's why the podcast is for also, you know, going going deep into the... Um, the explanation that you cannot really do in a paper, right? In the papers, usually it's a more technical audience first. And, and so like you're not going to really explain the difference between variational inference and MCMC in a paper because if the audience already is supposed to know that, well, why would you do that in a paper? Yeah, and, and frankly, the, the paper, so what ends up being, the, the discussion that ends up being in the paper is usually the discussion you've had with the reviewer, yeah. which is a subset, which is really a, a subset of everything you would like to to discuss. So so it's yeah, it's nice to have a more free format to really think about those questions. And I will what I will say is that actually the one format that that I really like where all these questions come up is you know is teaching is like workshops. And so when you do a workshop on you know Bayesian modeling, when you do a workshop on Stan, on PyMC or something like that, all the questions that I've brought up, you know, how long should the sampling phase be? How long should the warm-up phase be? Should I use this or that algorithm? Those are questions that a person sitting at a workshop, intro to stand, intro to you know your favorite language, would ask. And so these end up being forums where you know we do discuss these fundamental 
questions because even though they're they're you know they're deep they're elementary nonetheless and and i mean that in the most positive sense of the word elementary possible yeah completely you have have completely outmasked the way i pick questions for the show <laughs> it's just like doing the same as you did yeah i teach a lot of workshops too and these questions are basically the questions that a lot of beginners ask where it's like they often have used variational inference because for some reason, especially when they come from the classical machine learning uh, world, then using variational inference makes more sense to them because it's it's closer from home, basically closer to home. And so, yeah, like in then the natural question is, when should I use variational inference? Why should I use it? Why should I even bother with MCMC? Things like that. So <laughs> a lot of the questions I've been asking. These are totally open questions. I mean, correct me, maybe you have an answer that I missed, but you know, we have heuristics and we have good pointers and we have good case studies, but uh, so much of this remains unanswered, not unapproachable. Let me be clear, totally approachable. And you can, you know, it's, it's not crippling. We can totally still do a uh, Bayesian modeling, but there are open questions that linger. And then you have to strike the right balance between <laughs> when you're answering such a question from a, from a beginner where you want to be like intellectually honest and saying, yeah, like these are still open questions, but at the same time, you don't want them to walk away with the feeling that, well, this completely, like this completely undefined and I cannot really use these methods because no, there is no clear rule of about what I would use and when and why. So like that's always a, an, important balance to strike and not not always an easy one i absolutely relate to that actually before we we dig into into a bit more of the the applications i'm curious basically on the work you're doing right now because i really love the fact that you're both working on mcmc and on approximate approximate patient inference so i'm wondering what are the the frontiers currently currently in that field of, of algorithms that you find particularly excited about. You already mentioned the basically the progress of the hardware, which opens a lot of avenues. I'm curious if there are other things you have your eye on. I think hardware is is an important question. And I think it's a it's a it's a difficult question. And I want to talk, I think, you know, maybe I want to say a little bit more because I think frontier is good. And not only that, I think it's, it's an ambiguous frontier because I don't think, you know, to me, it's not clear, you know, how much we're going to get out of hardware for MCMC, for example. And, you know, what are going to be the limits of that? And so what I'm excited is that now we have GPUs. Now we have several algorithms that are GPU friendly. And I'll explain a little bit what that means, but essentially, so at a very fundamental level, what it means is you can run a lot of Markov chains in a synchronized time. And so you're not waiting for the slowest chain, basically. That's, that's kind of the, 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 the intuition here. And, you know, people are like, well, this is great. You know, if we run a lot of chains, we can really make the sampling phase much shorter. Like again, let's, so let's say your target effective sample size is 2000 and actually what effective sample size you should target that's that's another interesting and very fundamental question and it turns out a question where different people have different opinions on within the bayesian community but let's say now for sake of argument you're targeting an effective sample size of 2000 and i'm not saying this is what you should do or not do but let's just say 2000 then once you run 2000 chains and you warm them up enough right well, really, you only need one good sample per chain, which means your sampling phase can be one iteration. And then all your questions about how long should the warm-up be, it's no longer about, you know, adapting the kernel so that I have a low autocorrelation during the sampling phase. Actually, the autocorrelation only matters in so far as, as it reduces your bias, right? And so I think that suddenly we've greatly simplified the question of diagnosing you know, how much computation we need to throw at the algorithm. 
you know, if we have a lot of variance, then suddenly it just becomes about bias decay and the sampling problem becomes much closer to the optimization problem. And then I can go into questions. So then there are interesting things where you actually run a lot of chains. You can pool information between the different chains to make the warm up phase shorter. And for some problems, like you have these multimodal problems, like, like it's exponentially shorter, like you're never going to get a good answer with a single chain that doesn't use cross adaptation, right? And so here I want to I want to give a, a shout out to Marilou Gabriel and her work on MCMC that uses normalizing flow for adap adaptation, right? That's the thing. That's a technique where they actually you know run ten thousand workers or chains. And I remember when I was I was talking to her and colleagues, I was like, well, you know, once you you're already running ten thousand chains to jump between the modes, you actually don't need a long sampling phase at all, right? So that's one aspect of it. But then even for more ordinary problems, you can show that the, 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 the time it takes you to reduce the bias goes down with the number of chains because you are pulling information between the Markov chains. And this is not something that we really understand. And so, you know, where I see the frontier is that actually, if I run a lot of chains, I also get more accurate diagnostics. My computations of R hat and its generalization become much more reliable. And I think the holy grail would be something where we don't have users specify the length of the warm-up phase or the length of the sampling phase. We have them think about what is your target ESS, that's the number of chains that you run, and then we're gonna automatically stop the warm-up phase when we hit a certain target, right? And then suddenly, we're, we're, we're starting to do optimal computation for MCMC. And I think that to do optimal computation, you know, at least in the way that I've described it, we need those GPUs. And at the same time, you know, I think that there are a lot of problems that are not going to be amenable to, to GPUs, right? It's still, there's still this fundamental sequential component, which is, you know, the, the bias has to go down, the warm up needs to happen, right? At some point, adding more chains is not going to help you, right? Whether you, the speed up you're going to get on this is not going to be arbitrarily large, right? And then, you know, the benefit you're going to get from various reduction by running more chains, well, you know, once you've hit, if your target ESS is 2,000, maybe it doesn't it, it doesn't help to run 10,000 chains, right? Or at least not immediately, right? So those are very clear, you know, questions that arise about, you know, ultimately what are how far are we going to be able to go with this ES this uh, you know running many chains? But what I want to emphasize is that there's a you know there's a computational gain which people think about. Our algorithms are faster. But I also think there's a conceptual gain, and there is the opportunity to make MCMC more black box. And what I mean by that is we're less reliant on some very fundamental tuning algorithms. And therefore, you know, you know, we, we kind of get into this regime where the computation that we're using is just the right amount. And that's really, you know, if I, if I have to say, like I have another one or two years as a postdoc, very optimistically, that's the problem I'd like to solve. We remove the fundamental tuning parameters of MCMC. And there are other approaches towards that. By the way, I'm not going to pretend that this is the, uh, the only angle to tackle this problem. Let, let me be absolutely clear. But I think it's a very, very promising. Yeah, yeah. for sure. That's what, what I will say is, since we're going to go into applications, is one limitation with GPUs is they're very bad at solving ODEs. And a lot of the problems that I care about you know, have likelihoods. And in order to evaluate those likelihoods, you need to solve an ODE, right? So... You know, I don't think we're at a stage where running a thousand chains on a GPU is going to solve all the problems in pharmacometrics that I am, you know, deeply invested in. That said, you know, we have clusters of CPUs where maybe we can run 60 to 120 chains and that can get us some of the way. When you were talking about, about that, I was thinking that'd be super cool to have, you know, in Stan or PyMC afterwards, like at some point, automize away the number of chains and samples that are taken instead of having them, because right now it's like, okay, we're going to run as many chains as we can with the GP, GPU or CPU we have. So that's already kind of auth automate, automated, but the number of samples is not really opt automated. It's like just a rule of thumb where it's like, okay, we think in general, these number of samples work well. Uh, in PyMC, it's 1,000 per, per chain after warming up. But like, what would be super cool is like, okay, like PyMC or Stan, 
get see what's there, the resources, and then it's like, okay, so given the complexity of the posterior that we can see right now, like we are going to run that many chains and that many sample per chain, that, that'd be super cool. Because also that would be something that would be easier for the beginners because they are really, really, really sometimes very anxious about having a lot of samples, even though you know, no, you don't need 10,000 samples for that per chain for that simple regression. But it's hard to explain. Also, what ends up happening, you know, very real experience, and I do it myself, is the simple models that probably don't need that many iterations. I run them for a lot of iterations because that's computationally cheap to do. And then the hard models where, you know, each iteration is very expensive and the posterior distribution is much more complicated. I actually end up, you know, and where I would need more iterations, I end up running less iterations. <laughs> yeah. Right. And and I think a lot of people will sympathize with that. That's my experience interacting with practitioners. I'll give you another example of things I've seen my colleagues in epidemiology do is that when their model starts getting really complicated, they start using somewhat less over dispersed initializations. Even though we know that that's what we need for the convergence diagnostic to be reliable. And I'll tell you a little bit about more about that, because actually, that's another question. It's like, what does it mean for an initialization to be over dispersed? And I have some answers to that, that that are not quite, you know, the regular answers. But that's a huge problem. Like when models get hard, and again, those ODE based models, right? You cannot solve those ODEs if you throw insane parameter values at your model. And so now people have to have to make compromises. And, and I think that, you know, especially statisticians, we're a little bit cavalier. We, try, we tend to be conservative because maybe in a way, you know, that's the role of the statistician and the theorist is to be conservative and to, be, and to play it safe. But when the safe and the conservative heuristics become impractical, we, we need to think harder about, OK, if we don't want to be too conservative, but we still want to be safe, what do we need to do? And that's where these questions of, you know, optimal warm-up length, optimal sampling phase, optimal over-dispersed initialization really come in, into play. Because if you're too conservative in your prescriptions, you might make your editor happy, but actually practitioners are going to have a really hard time following those uh, those prescriptions. And then they do things. I'm not saying that they do uh, silly things instead. Right. But they, they, they do they do other things that are maybe, you know, less principled. Yeah, fascinating. I could spend I could spend the whole the whole episode on this on this topic. So I, I really love it. Thanks a lot for diving so deep into into this, Charles. But let's get a bit more practical here and talk about what you do basically with epidemiology and pharmacometrics. So first can you define pharmacometrics for us? I personally don't know what that is how that differs from epidemiology and what do Bayesian statistics bring to epidemiology and, and pharmacometrics? Pharmacometrics. I mean, the way I would think about pharmacometrics is pharmacometrics is to pharmacology what econometrics is to economics. Some people who want to emphasize that they're using quantitative methods. Mm -hmm. Now, the particular field of pharmacometrics that I've worked on is is called PKPD modeling, so pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And essentially, what happens is, let's say there's a new treatment that's being developed. So it could be a new drug compound, or it could be a number of things. We're usually interested in two questions: is one, how does the drug get absorbed, and how does it diffuse in the in the patient's body? So that's called the pharmacokinetics. And two, once the drug diffuses in the body, what does it do to the body? Right? And so that includes, you know, targeting a disease, but also side effects. Right? We're always worried about, you know, how toxic a treatment might be. And what people are trying to do with these models is based on early data from clinical trials. So either on human beings or even on animals, and they try to predict what is going to happen when we look at a broader population of individuals and when we kind of like start changing the treatment. So some, you know, some medical treatments can get very complicated. You have questions of, you know, I have a certain drug compound. How much do I administer? How often do I administer it? Is it better to take, you know, half a dose 
every half hour or only a single dose every hour, right? And so you have all these combinatorics of, of possibilities. If I really increase the dose, do I immediately get better effects or does it kind of saturate, right? We often have these nonlinear effects. They're called Michaelis Menten models where at some point, right, adding, you know, more dose, it raises the cost and it doesn't help the patient. And one way to do it would be if you run a ton of clinical trials and then and then you hope that something works out and that's extremely expensive and time consuming and you know maybe it's it's safer for the it's safer for the humans than than the animals let me put it this way or you based on a bit of data and then a really mechanistic model where you actually really bake in some of your you know expertise as a as a pharmacologist as a biomedical engineer, you try to understand the underlying system so that when you're trying out different regimens, you can really predict what are going to be the doses that are more promising. So it's very useful to do exploratory analysis. And then it's also useful to do, you know, once a drug hits the market, you actually collect very imperfect data, you actually have uncertainty, but you still want to keep learning about the dose and the dosing regimen. Right, from data from hospitals. And sometimes the data is rare. You have rare diseases, rare conditions, and that kind of thing. Right? So that is, if you will, the, the domain of pharmacometrics. And what's extremely interesting is that within that domain, you have, so first of all, you have what's called mechanistic models. And what I mean by that is the parameters are interpretable. The relationship between models is interpretable. You know, I'll contrast that with a neural network, for example, where I might get good predictions. But then if I want to do out-of-sample predictions, which is actually really what we want to do, right, in pharmacometrics, right, examples of out-of-samples would be a different dosing regimen, or I've tested the drug on an adult population. What happens if I do it for children, right? That's the kind of pediatric questions. Right? We need to bake in the mechanistic understanding, which doesn't ex exclude a role in neural networks. I think these can also play a role, but I'll leave that for now. But then you have various degrees of details in the mechanism. You have some equations that are very simple. So a two-compartment model with first-order absorption says the human body is three compartments. There's the gut, where the drug arrives when you orally administer it. There is the central compartment, where the drug diffuses quickly. So usually that includes the blood. Right? And then maybe there's a peripheral compartment, so tissues where the drug diffuses more slowly. Right. That's obviously not a very detailed description of the human body. And then you have models that are more complicated. So at Metrum, Matthew Riggs and some colleagues, they work on this bone mineral density where actually they had a lot of different parameters. And now instead of having a system of three differential equations, you have 30 differential equations. You have a ton of parameters, but you have a lot of information, prior information about these parameters. Right. And then you have people who, you know, really throw, you know, differential equations with, you know, hundreds of states at them and, uh, you know, thousands of interpretable parameters. And frankly, I don't think we have the Bayesian computation to fit those models, even though in theory, they lend themselves extremely well to a Bayesian analysis, right? I think that realistically, we're somewhere in the semi-mechanistic regime. So these are models that have some level of sophistication, but already we pay a dire price for this sophistication which is that the computation can take hours or days to fit. And so there's like really this potential for better Bayesian computation can really allow people to deploy better models and more sophisticated models. The other big aspect of, of pharmacometrics is usually we have trials with data from different patients. There's heterogeneity between the patients or similarity between patients. So that lends itself very well to hierarchical modeling. And we know hierarchical modeling is hard. It tends to create these posterior distributions with geometries that are very frustrating. And I spent a lot of time worrying about hierarchical models. I've done a lot of work on nested Laplace approximations. So that's another nice example of an approximation. It's not variational inference. It has very complementary qualities. And what the nested Laplace approximation allows you to do is marginalize out the latent variables in a hierarchical model. And people often explain nested Laplace as, oh, it's great, it reduces the dimension of your problem. And then we can throw a quadratic at the remaining parameters. And we've had models where we had thousands of hyperparameters. Those were genetic problems where we were using horseshoe priors to select genes. So even once you marginalize out the latent variables, you still have a high-dimensional problem. So we threw Hamilton and Monte Carlo at it. 
but it still made a big difference because we simplified the geometry of the posterior distribution by doing this marginalizations for the hierarchical models, right? So I'm very excited about the prospect of having, you know, an acid plus approximation in STAN. We have a prototype that works really well. We have some really cool automatic differentiation supporting it. But, and you know, but, you know, the problem is, again, I want to try this on ODE-based models. I don't get a good approximation. I don't get efficient automatic differentiation. I get something that's unstable. Now, the simple examples where I got it working, it actually gave surprisingly accurate results. But this is, again, an example where here's this awesome algorithm and statistical methods, and it just gets frustrated by the nature of the problems we encounter in pharmacometrics, even though, you know, these are hierarchical models and these methods are designed for hierarchical models. But again, if your likelihood is not a general linear model, yeah, suddenly those approximations become much more tricky. And that's why, that's why you know, I think that we have to use MCMC for these models. That's interesting. So in these cases, yeah, that makes it a bit clearer, I think, for, for people in the, like, the practical the practical cases where where you would have to do that that trade off basically how do you choose between the two the trade off between the different methods I think it's very important. And that said, I do want to say that there's some really cool approximations that people do deploy in in pharmacometrics. I recently read a, a, a I'm a review, I'm an anonymous reviewer, so I'm not going to give out too many details. Sure. But but what I liked, you know, it's it's, it's there were questions of what if we fix those parameters or what if we draw these parameters from their priors because they're removed away enough from the data so that maybe they're not influenced that much by the data. So the posterior stays close to the prior, but nonetheless, we need that uncertainty for the interpretable quantities in the middle, right? And so people are coming up with these compromises. And of course, now we're again in the business of we have these awesome computational constraints. People come up with these approximations either of the inference or even, you know, they say, well, let's use a simpler model. We know there's a more complicated model out there, but maybe we still get all the answers that we need with the simpler model. And so now we get again in this, you know, the question of understanding what are the simplifications that we get away with? What are the ones where we pay a heavy price? Can we actually quantify the price we're paying? Can we diagnose when the simplification is is too dire or not? And as far as I can tell, the answer is you know, we're not at the stage of diagnosing the problem, we're, but, but at least now people are taking this problem seriously enough that they're building these case studies. Now, based on these case studies where, you know, we do try out the different models and we do fit the complicated methods and we're able to say something about the simpler methods because we, we did fit the complicated methods. So it's an academic exercise in a way, but at least it gives us, you know, that's how it starts. And that's how we're going to start developing the intuition and the heuristics to then deal with deploying the approximations and the simplifications in practice. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. And so actually, do you have an an example of a research project that where where you applied Bayesian statistics in these in this field of pharmacometrics and where really Bayesian statistics helped you uncover very important insights thanks to to all those those methods that that you've talked about i've never led a project in pharmacometrics i've always collaborated with pharmacologists and it's true that my work has been more methodological has been more developing torsion itself that's it and what i can talk about is some of the interactions i've had with uh, with pharmacometricians and uh, some of the works where maybe i'm more contributor than say the, the project lead and I'll give you one example, and then I think that if we have time and we talk a little bit about, about epidemiology, I have a very good example in epidemiology. Ah, okay. Awesome. But this is a, this was super cool, actually. This is a, this is a bit anecdotal. I don't know that there's a preprint on this now, but I was in Paris. I was visiting the INSERM, which does a lot of you know medical work, and I was visiting France Montre's group, and they have fantastic people there. And I'm talking with Julie Bertrand. And she's interested in pharmacogenetics, right? So where we have some some genome sequencing or some gene tracking that's involved, and we're trying to see how a patient reacts to a treatment or to a certain condition. And in that case, what ended up happening? So you know, one of the things that was frustrating is they're trying to identify what are the genes that are meaningful that that seem to to have a meaningful connection to the outcome of the treatments. 
and they couldn't get anything that is statistical signif statistically significant, you know, in the uh, traditional sense, right? There wasn't one one gene, one SNP that unambiguously stood out as yes, this is a meaningful SNP, and it should it should intervene in earlier analysis, right? And what they had done was a was a, a Bayesian analysis where they had used a horseshoe prior. And so what the horseshoe prior does is it, it, it does like, it's a regularization tool that does a soft selection, right? And the way that soft selection manifests is there is a quantity that you can look at and it will usually be bimodal. And one mode will indicate that, you know, the covariate that corresponds to this SNP is completely regressed to zero, right? So, you know, that's an indication that this is not a very useful explanatory variable. And then the second mode tells you, actually, this variable matters, and it's not regressed to zero, right? And so why are there two modes? Is because there is uncertainty. But the very cool thing is that even though there was no SNP SNP that stood out as this is the meaningful SNP, you had two SNPs that came up, and they both had a bimodal, right? So what that means is you couldn't definitely say that either SNP mattered, right? But you could say, okay, with some probability, either of those SNPs can matter. But here's where it gets very interesting is that actually, because you have a multivariate posterior distribution, you can go a bit further and you realize that the two SNPs are anti-correlated. And so what that means is when, when you have a lot of posterior mass at one mode for one SNP that says this variable matters, don't regress it to zero, the other covariate would always get regressed to zero and vice versa, right? So what the, the multivariate analysis tells you and, and what this proper treatment of uncertainty tells you is like, yeah, you can't you know, say that you know, one SNP is statistically significant in the traditional sense, but now you have this, this more comprehensive treatment of uncertainty that tells you, but you know what? It has to be one of those two. You can't tell for sure which one, but it has to be one of those two. And that's a nice example where you know, we're really... You know, not just looking at the maximum likelihood estimator or even the expectation value or just the variance. We're really looking at multiple variables and the uncertainty across those multiple variables, right? So I think that's a very neat example and a paper to look forward to when it comes out or again. Again, this was anecdotal. This was a conversation in the, in the laboratory. But I got very excited about that example. Yeah, I mean, that sounds super exciting. Thanks a lot for sharing that. And yeah, like if uh, when the when the paper is out, please get in touch, and then that that be a fun uh, fun thing to talk about again. Basically, you have been working on on Torsten, which is, if I understood correctly, pharmacometrics application of Stan models. That was interesting to me because the Bayesian field has been evolving really, really fast. Lately, especially with the new techniques, the new software tools, and you've definitely been part of, of that effort, a chance. So I'm wondering if there are any recent developments that have particularly excited you, especially in your field of pharmacometrics and epidemiology, and also in relation with, relationship with what you're doing with Torsten. Let me give one example. So not a comprehensive answer, but... An illustrative answer. Yeah, it's great. Yet another fundamental question that would come up at a workshop is, uh, okay, I have this ODE integrator. I need to solve an ODE to evaluate my likelihood. And the ODEs come with certain tuning parameters. In particular, what is the precision with which you, so you should solve your ODE? And that is going to have an impact on the quality of your inference and also the runtime. Right? Because if you solve the ODE with a very strict tolerance, it takes much longer to solve that ODE. And so again, that comes back to the question of how much computation should we throw at the problem? For the longest time, I, I didn't have a good answer, and, and you know maybe I still don't, to that question. The way this manifested is either you know, at workshops when, when teaching the subject, but even when, when we were writing the STAN manual, we have a page on ODE integrators. We are, we have a, you know, we state these are the default values that we use, but we don't have any clear recommendations on what is the precision you should use. And we kind of assume that the user knows their ODE well enough so that they'll know which ODE integrator to pick and what tolerance to set, which is not realistic, 
right? But it's just we don't we didn't have an answer to that question, right? And so recently, there was a paper, and I, so I know that. Uh, let me look up exactly who the I know Aki is a co-author on it. Aki Vatari. I wanna I wanna give a shout out to the to the lead author. Yeah, for sure. And we'll put we'll put that also in in the show notes for this episode. Yeah. So there you go. So Yuho Timonen is the lead author. Is the lead author, and then there are a bunch of other people on it. So their paper is an important sampling approach for Bayesian ODs. And so essentially, what they realize is, you know, if when you're solving, when you're using a numerical integrator to evaluate your likelihood, really, you're not computing the true likelihood. You're computing an approximation of this likelihood. And we have a lot of tools in statistics where when we're not dealing with the exact likelihood, but some approximation to this likelihood, notably in the field of important sampling. And what they came up with is, a way to use those tools that exist in important sampling to actually check whether the approximate likelihood and therefore the tuning parameter of the OD integrators are precise enough or not, right? And so that gives you a diagnostic that you can use. It's not a completely perfect diagnostic. And, and, and I think I'm, I'm still trying to you know test that idea and play around with it and see how well it really works. So I want to try it out on pharmacometrics problems. Right now I'm writing, I've been tasked with writing a tutorial on Torsten. So we released part one a while ago, now we're writing part two. And we promised that in part two, we'd explain how to tune the ODs, except <laughs> we only know so much how to tune the ODs. So I am trying this method. I'm trying this method on the ODs, but it's just getting me, you know, thinking about are the tolerances we're using too conservative? Are they too strict? Do we actually get important speed ups? And I'm teaching a, a course this September in Leuven for the advanced summer school on Bayesian methods, where I'm going to have the students on an epidemiology problem, on a pharmacokinetic problem, try out different tolerances and see the differences and then build this diagnostic that's based on important sampling to check whether the precision with which they're solving their ODs is making meaningful changes to the inference, right? And so again, I think that this is one tuning parameter where either we're using OD solvers that are not precise enough or OD solvers that are too slow. We're not being optimal in our computation. And you know, this is preventing us from either getting accurate answers or deploying models with the sophistication that we would want to use. And so that's a development that I'm excited about. The one caveat that I will throw in this is that right now we're still thinking about it as a single tuning parameter. When what I've observed in practice is that the behavior of the OD can change widely depending on where you are in the parameter space. So for certain parameter values, you don't need to be super precise. And for other parameter values, you need a lot more precision or you need a different type of integrator because the, the OD just behaves in a different way. Now, very concretely, how does this manifest? So I don't want to say it's hopeless, but what ends up happening is during the warm-up phase, where we start the Markov chains far off in the parameter space, or we haven't tuned the MCMC sampler, so the Markov chains are still jumping left and right. During the warm-up phase, we are more vulnerable to those extreme parameter values. Whereas during the sampling phase, we get away with less strict OD solvers. So I think that somehow, you know, what I would like to do is, uh, is two things. One, I would like to have a very automatic automatic way of running this diagnostics in Torsten, but I also want to give users control over what OD solver do they use at different stages of MCMC. Because I think that makes a crucial difference. Another way to approach this problem is coming up coming up with good initializations. If I can start my MCMC near, you know, in, within the parameter space where I might land from the stationary distribution, and I know that here the parameter values are a bit less absurd, and so solving the ODEs is a bit more feasible computationally, if I can start there, then maybe I'm skipping the early regions that really frustrate my ODE integrator and my MCMC sampler. And the way this manifests in practice is you'll have, you know, you run, let's say you run eight chains, you have six of them that finish quickly, and then you have two of them that are lagging because they're stuck 
somewhere during the warm-up phase, they're encountering this region where the parameter values are a little bit absurd. Your OD is super hard to solve, and that's eating up all your computation. And the truth is, you know, at least in the way we, we do things right now, we always wait for the slowest chain, which, by the way, we don't have to do. So I'm excited about methods to come up with good initializations. And I think that this is a place where variation inference can be good, right? So the, especially now the Pathfinder variation inference, right, was originally designed to produce good initializations for MCNC. And so getting good initializations, that's a great example of, I need a good answer, but not a super precise answer. And so, you know, if somehow Pathfinder can help me skip the regions that frustrate ODE integrators, I think that's a big win for pharmacometrics. Again, that's that's something we have to, to, to test and really try out. But I will say, now going back, I'm going to make a, another connection back to our hat, which is when we think about over dispersion, really what over dispersion means. So we, we have shown a bit formally that what makes our hat reliable, and we define reliability in a formal sense, is the initial variance has to be large relative to the initial bias. Now, if you have an initialization, like, you know, you draw your sample from your prior, and that's reliable, and then you throw variation inference, right? If variation inference reduces your squared bias more than it reduces your variance, it turns out you preserve the property of reliability. So there's actually a sense that we might be able to get good initializations for MCMC without compromising the reliability of our diagnostics for convergence, right? And these are all the pieces that I think can come together and really help a great deal with, you know, pharmacometrics, but more generally with OD-based models and even more generally models based on implicit functions. And I do include things that use nested Laplace approximations in that because that's an optimization problem. That's an implicit function. It has the same kind of misbehaviors that an ODE has, but also technologies that we develop for ODEs in a Bayesian context, better initializations, different tolerances, important sampling corrections would apply to nested Laplace stuff. So, so those are the things that I'm excited about, but it's going to take time. I just want to, I just want to be perfectly honest. It, it takes time to really, you know, you know, between the paper and the software implementation and the, you know, clear description in the manual that the users can can follow, it takes a lot of time. For sure. I mean, that stuff is really at the frontier of the research. So it does make sense that it takes time to percolate from how to find a solution to, okay, this is how we can implement it and reproduce it reliably. And I'm most concerned about how speculative I am for, for some of the ideas I'm sharing. But I think these are these are directions where it's worth pushing the research. That has a, the potential to have a really big impact. For sure. And so, so I put in the show notes the Pathfinder paper, actually. That made me think that um, I should do an episode about about the Pathfinder paper, basically what what that is about and and what that means uh, concretely. So I'll try to do that. And if you haven't reached out to, to Lu Zhang, you know, I mean, it, you know, first of all, the, the paper is great, but actually sitting down and and discussing this with her, you know, at the blackboard or whatever, like she has so many ideas that have not appeared in the paper itself. So, so I think you know, if I can recommend. A guest, if you haven't had her already, I don't know if you, but yeah, Lu Zhang, I think, would be fantastic to interview. I was actually thinking about inviting her on the podcast to talk about uh, Pathfinder because, well, she's the lead author on the paper, and also all the other authors have been on the show <laughs> Bob ah, cool. Carpenter, Andrew Gellman, Aki Vetari. So Lu Zhang is, is, missing, is missing. So definitely need to correct that. So yeah, in the near future, definitely try. To have that episode, that'd be a very, very interesting one. So maybe can you talk, Charles, about... So I'll give you two, two avenues and you, you pick the one you, you, you prefer because I don't want to take too much of your time. But basically, I'm curious either about hearing an example of your work in the epidemiology field, or you can talk a bit more in general about a very, very common question that 
students always ask me, and it's about priors. So basically, how do you choose the prior? How do you approach the challenge of choosing appropriate prior distributions? And especially when you're dealing with complex models. So these are the two avenues I have in mind. And feel free to pick one or pick both. <laughs> so let me say that about priors, I think that I want to get better answers. A better answer to this question and you know like the next time workshop that i'm giving i don't have a module on priors that i find satisfactory and so i'm still undergoing this journey but what i will do is i'll give i'll talk about epidemiology and i will talk about the prior that we use there and so that will be that would be an example and uh, i i like to think through examples i like to think through the anecdotal as complementary to the formal i'm a big fan of fairy tales and fables, you know, simple stories that, that have good themes. So, so what happened in epidemiology, and this will be a good example, is, well, the pandemic happened, and suddenly COVID, we're all going home, and we had colleagues in, in epidemiology, in particular uh, Julien Riou. So I actually met Julien Riou at a, at a stand con. He was a, in Cambridge. He was a PhD student at the time, and he, he demonstrated his model, and he was using those ODE-based models. So now, instead of having a drug compound that flows between different parts of the body, what you have is, you know, the, you, you separate the population, the human population, to these different compartments, so susceptible individuals, infected individuals, recovered individuals, and then the individuals flow between the compartments. And there, there are a bit more layers. But basically, the, the mathematical formalism that I had familiarized myself with in the context of pharmacometrics turned out to be very relevant to certain classes of epidemiological models. And essentially, uh, Julien was working on an early model of COVID-19. They were trying to estimate the mortality rate. There was a lot of uncertainty in the data. There were a lot of things to correct for, right? So, for example, early on, not everyone got tested. And testing was not widely available. Who got tested? The people with severe symptoms. So now if you think about you're trying to estimate the mortality rate, and according to your data, the people who catch the disease are only the ones who have severe symptoms, then it looks like a lot of people are dying from the disease. I mean, a lot of people were dying from the disease, but that inflates the number. There's a bias because you're only testing the people who are sick, right? You're not testing the people with mild symptoms or even with no symptoms. The other bias was some of the people who, who had caught the virus had not died yet, right? So you count them as living, but that doesn't mean they survived the disease, right? So that's a bias in another direction. And that's an example where you actually have, you know, a somewhat mechanistic model, it's based on epidemiology of how a disease transmits and circulates in a population. Then on top of that, you need to build a measurement model to account for you know, how the data is collected. But at the end of the day, none of the, we were not able to draw any conclusions unless we understood what was the, the rate of people who were symptomatic or had severe symptoms. Right? And so there's one parameter in the model, which is the asymptomatic rate. And so now you have two options in a classic classical statistics frameworks. Either you, you fix the parameter and then you're making a strong assumption and maybe you try different values of the fixed parameter or you just say, well, I don't know this. So really I have no idea what the mortality rate is because maybe the entire population was infected or maybe only a small fraction was infected and everyone in that small fraction had the severe disease. And so we needed an in-between saying we don't know anything and saying we know everything. And this is why I think where Bayesian shines, which is we can quantify uncertainty. We have more nuanced statements through the language of probability about what our state of knowledge is. And actually, what had happened is there were some instances where we had measured an, asymptom an asymptom asymptomatic rate. And the example was uh, it was a cruise ship, the Diamond Princess, in the coast of Japan. So they had identified some cases of COVID-19. They put the cruise ship in quarantine and they test everybody, regardless of whether they had symptoms or not. Right? So now you have a small population, and based on that small population, you get an estimate of the asymptomatic, asymptotic rate, asymptomatic rate, sorry. And then you had one or two incidents where people do that. There were some cities where you know, they had you know, done some other experiments and measured some, some other data. 
And so then you bring all that information and you use that information to construct priors and then to propagate uncertainties into the model, right? The reason we're able to make predictions and then to calculate things like the mortality rate with the appropriate uncertainty is because we had a prior on the asymptomatic rate. And that's a very nice example. This is more an example of why it was crucial to have a prior rather than how should you construct priors in general, right? This is a bit of a specific case, but it's a very good example. And so I'll recommend two papers. One is is the one by Julien Rioux, which was, so this was disappeared in PLOS Medicine, and it's with a lot of contributors, but it's estimation of SARS-CoV-2 mortality during the early stages of an epidemic. And then the other paper that goes a bit more into what are the lessons that we learned from this from a Bayesian workflow perspective is Bayesian workflow for disease transmission modeling in STAN. And so here the first author was was Leo Leo Grintiach. And then we had also Lisa Semenova and Junior Ryu as co-authors. And this is a beautiful paper that, that really goes into the, here's the prior we use. Here's the first version of the model. Here are the limitations with this model. Here's how we diagnose the models. Here's the next iterations. And we go through all the iterations, right? And I'd like to throw the number that the model that eventually we used to model COVID-19 was the 15th iteration. And along the way, we were we had a model that took three days to, to run. And we had to change the, the, the way we wrote the stand model to improve the computation. So that had to do with how the ODE was parameterized and how the automatic differentiation was happening. We got it from three days to two days. And that's useful not sorry, three days to two hours, not two days, two hours, drastic speed up. And so that not only was good because the inference was faster, but that's what allowed us to then use more sophisticated versions of the model. All that is described in that Bayesian workflow for disease transmission model paper. So that's that's my epidemiology fairy tale. And I don't mean that in the sense that it had a happy ending or that everything was, was nice and glowing. I mean that, that you know, this is a very nice story that touches upon a lot of interesting themes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Definitely going to use a link to this paper in the in the show notes. I already have it in the on the the Stan website. Actually, you've done a, a case study on this, so that that's perfect with all the co-authors. So I'm going to put that right now in the show notes. And maybe last question before letting you go, Charles. I'm breaking records these days on the on the episodes. Like, is episode nine eighty nine is going out this week? Actually, it's so far the longest episode. It's about two hours, <laughs> and right now we're like approaching this record. Which also, uh, like, well done. And at the same time, as a fantastic podcast, and I forget the name. It's a German podcast. Uh-huh. Can't believe I forget the name. I'll try and email you what it is. But basically, they do interviews with these, you know, intellectuals and. Well, as that, you know, politicians and well, as that, you know, I'm not saying all politicians are intellectuals, but people who have opinions and thoughts and there's no time limit to the interview. And they just go on and on and on and on and on. And, and they just have so many topics to discuss. It's really, uh, I'm not saying you should do that with me, but you could imagine like, you know, for someone like, uh, you know, uh, some, some of the other co-authors that have come up. Like, I feel like you could you could talk six hours with them and you would just pick their brain and they would have so much insights to share. Like I mean, m- most of the time the limitation is the is the guest's own uh, own time. <laughs> they have, yeah, I think it's really cool this idea of uh, yeah we're gonna do. What if we didn't have a time limit on the interview? What would happen? And uh, you know, it, eventually somebody gets hungry and that's what happens. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but so basically before. Asking you the last two questions, I'm also wondering because you also teach, so that that's super interesting to to me. Um, and I often hear that a lot of practitioners and beginners, in particular, might be hesitant or even intimidated to adopt patient methods because they perceive them as complex. So I don't necessarily agree with that you know, that underlying assumption, but without necessarily disputing it, what do you do in those cases? Basically, what resources or strategies do you recommend to those who want to learn and apply patient techniques in the work, but might be intimidated or hesitant? Most of the time, it's people who are already, you know, interested in Bayesian methods. 
especially if it's a workshop on stand, the people who do sign up, you know, they they already have adhered to to Bayesian methodology. So I don't know that I've really had to convince that many people. Definitely when I was a TA at Columbia, I had those conversations a bit more with the students, especially when I TA the PhD level course that, you know, everyone has to take applied statistics and, you know, not everyone is going to do Bayesian, right? And so we have those conversations. But I think that ultimately what it is, is it's not that Bayesian is, is complex, it's analysis is complex. Analysis is difficult. And when you use less complicated methods, you know, like uh, maximum likelihood estimates or point estimates, and these are not simple. I, I, I really don't want to undermine, you know, the, the difficulty related to those methods and the fact that they are useful in a lot of applications. But in a way, th- those methods are simple and they will work for simple analysis. But if an analysis requires you to quantify uncertainty, to propagate uncertainty, to, you know, take some decisions with imperfect data, and then someone says, well, I don't want to be Bayesian because that's complicated, but I still want, you know, to quantify uncertainty and I still want to propagate uncertainty and I still want to make predictions. Well, suddenly the classical methods, you, you really have to do a lot of gymnastic to get them to do what, what you're interested in. And, and so the classical methods also become complicated. And that's more because you're trying to use them for, you know, to do a sophisticated analysis. And so I think that what matters is to really meet practitioners where they are, what is the problem they're interested in? And, you know, does the, you know, is it, is it a problem where, you know, the, 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 the complexity of the analysis would be handled in a relatively straightforward way by a Bayesian analysis? And the answer could be yes, it could also be no. And if it's no, that's fine. You know, I think that, again, we, ha- we have to be loyal to, to the problem more so than to the field or to, or to the method. But that's how I would start this conversation. And so when, you know, when I'm sitting with former chemetricians, and by the way, a lot of them don't, don't use Bayesian, I think I can, I can talk for 30 minutes about what do we want to get out of, the, out of a pharmacokinetic analysis without bringing up what kind of statistics we do. And once we've established the common goals, then we think about what are the methods that are going to get there, right? That's how I would do it. Frankly, I haven't had that much experience doing it. So take what I say with a grain of salt. Yeah, but I, I really think it's, Bayesian is complicated because it confronts you with the complexity of data analysis. It doesn't introduce the complexity. Let me put it this way. Let's call it to show then. Uh, me too, I could, I could keep asking you uh, a lot of things, but let's do another episode, another day. That'd be a fun thing. Or if one day you had a, you know, a model you've been working about and that you think would be beneficial for listeners to go through. I have this new format now, which are the modeling webinars where basically you would come on the show and share your screen and show us your, your code and, and do some live, some life coding about basically project that you've been working on. And so if, if one day you have something like that, feel free to, to get in touch and, and we'll get that organized because it's a really, really cool new format and I really love it. In August, we've had Justin Boyce showcasing how to do a Bayesian modeling workflow in the biostatistics world. And so even, even if you're not a biostatistician, it's a really useful thing because basically, as we were saying, Bayes are basically methods. And so even though the field might not be yours, the methods are definitely transferable in the workflow. So that was a, a very fun one. And then we've got one coming up in September, in theory, with Benjamin Vincent. And we're going to dive into the do operator, the new do operator that we have in PyMC and how to use that. So that's going to be a very fun one too. So yeah, I, I love I love the idea of that format. And I'm, I'm definitely going to check out the two webinars, the one that's already there and the one that's coming up. Actually, the, the, the two topics sound extremely interesting. I'll send that to you. And uh, yeah, for sure, that that's something I've, I've been starting to do. And so yeah, if you have one such analysis one day, feel free to, to reach out. That'd be a fun one. Absolutely. So before letting you go, of course, 
I'm going to ask you the last two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. One, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? I thought about this and uh, <laughs> I feel like so much of my work is about working under computational constraints, you know, and time constraints and resource constraints. And suddenly you relax all of this. And uh, I really love the problems I worked on in astronomy. I am mind blown by some of the stuff my colleagues do in cosmology, where they're trying to understand, you know, the early universe. <laughs> they have they have models with six parameters that apparently explain the entire structure of the of the universe. I like to understand that that a little bit better. I love the work I did on exoplanets. I think thinking about yeah, is there life on other planets? How does it manifest? My advisor, when I was an undergrad, she uh, she put it a good way. She said, you know, astronomy helps us think about our position in the universe, our place in the universe. And, you know, yeah, if I have unlimited time and, and resources in this completely ideal scenario, I, I think I would gravitate towards these really, really big questions, which, by the way, I can still get involved in right now as a researcher in, in Flatiron, but, but it's true that it's, there's more competition for that. And just... There's a theme that I, um, yeah, okay, if I, if I had thought about this more, I would have just started there. But, but there's a theme that I really like. And that this goes back to cosmology, to astronomy, you know, which is this idea of a theory of everything and, you know, a very fundamental model. And, you know, maybe it all reduces to one equation or one set of equations. And what I really wonder is, you know, A, if we did have that model and that theory, how much insight would we actually get from it? Because, you know, you can have a simple system with simple particles and simple interaction rules. And that doesn't mean you understand the emerging behavior of the system. And if I had unlimited resources and I can actually figure out what that equation is and then run the simulations with infinite computation and then study the behavior and, and actually, you know, at a, at a very conceptual level, understand how much insight do we get out of this. And the example I like to, to give is, you know, the rules of chess are simple. But just because you understand the rules of chess doesn't mean you understand chess. And I think that there is a, you know, there is a tension with the reductionist view of physics and the the state of the world that we live in that is kind of related to that. And that sometimes the simplifications that we use, the involvement of probability theory, of statistics, that's still still useful not just because we don't have the computation to run all the simulations based on fundamental equations, but because it, it actually is more intelligible to us. And, and yeah, I think with unlimited time and resources, you could you know, really explore that. Right? Once you can run all the simulations you want, what are the actual models that teach you something and that give you insight? So, so I tried that. That sounds like a fun one, for sure. <laughs> And second question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional, who would it be? That's not a definite answer. Let, let's put it as an answer. But I like the idea of talking, you know, with one of the you know, founders of hypothesis testing. So, you know, name it Pearson, Fisher, and, uh, you know, and by the way, just because I'm having a dinner with them, that doesn't mean I, I condone everything they've done and their character and their behavior, <laughs> just to full disclosure. But I think that I'd be interested, you know, to 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 ask them, you know, what what were you thinking when, when you came up with those ideas? And what what do you make of how this method that you've developed has been used and misused in current days? And what do you, you know, and also like I don't know how, how much Bayesian methods were on, on their radar, but what would they think of Bayesian methods now that we have the, the computations that are available? So kind of, you know, someone from the early 20th, late 19th century, one of those, you know, statisticians that's described as having done something foundational, but also that has worked with on a field, on a branch of statistics that historically has been opposed to the branch of statistics that I work on. And I think that could be, you know, hopefully a pleasant, certainly an engaging conversation for dinner. Yeah, very interesting answer and very original. You're, you're the first one to answer that. And I had not even thought about that, but that's, that definitely makes sense. If uh, having dinner with Laplace is on the table, I'm not saying I, I, I wouldn't take that. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. 
But yeah, that's definitely super interesting. And I do remember that, I mean, in my recollection, which of course is very <laughs> fuzzy as any Homo sapiens memory, we talked about that in episode 51 with Aubrey Clayton. And we talked about his book, Burnley's Fallacy and the Crisis of Modern Science. I'll put that into in, in the show notes. And I seem to remember also from his book that the founder of yeah, hypo hypothesis testing definitely had an active role in putting aside patient statistics at the time. That it was definitely very, very motivated also in that in that regard, but I don't remember one why on the top of my head. But so yeah, I put that into the show notes. I should re-listen to this episode also personally. That was a very interesting one. So I'll, I recommend it to uh, to people who, when I get started with the podcast, actually, I think it's a it's a very good first one to understand a bit more, basically why you would like to think a bit more about the foundations of hypothesis testing and why it's interesting to think about other frameworks and why the Bayesian framework is an interesting one. That sounds great. Yeah. Uh, so maybe I could have dinner with, uh, remind me the name oh, of your guest. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, add that to my answer. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Charles, for, for taking the time. As usual, I put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Charles, for taking the time and being on this show. Thanks, Alex, for, for the invitation and, and also, you know, the, the service to the community that I think this podcast is. It's really a fantastic resource. So thank you very much. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman, with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good Bayesian. and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation.